Le- mm. Yes. So, um, what is transhumanism? Uh, I will try to show you that transhumanism is, uh, first of all, a storytelling serving a strategic marketing of biospheric dimension. And not only biospheric, but exospheric. And such a storytelling aims to claim leadership of the biosphere at the, in the age, uh, uh, it becomes not only uh, biospheric or exospheric, but what I would call also extraspheric, that is um, living Earth orbit. Is transhumanism the price of what is called posthumanism? And are we in the stage of what is called posthuman future? For example, by this very bad thinker who is Francis Fukuyama, very bad for me. I consider myself these questions irrelevant. If it is true that first, human is not a question of philosophy. Because human is not, has no any unity, no essence, changing every time, that is every time inventing new modes of existence and being defined in its so-called humanity by these modes. This is the reason for which Hopi in Hopi's language means human. Hopis are uh, Amerindian people of uh, Mexico. And human in European languages means understanding and following European standards of existence, becoming universal, as Le says, through the market. These having become consumerist disintegration, these standards. The question of philosophy is neither human nor being as Socrates replied to, to Protagoras when Socrates said the question is not human but being. For me, it's not being, it is noises. That is, if you prefer, what is thinking. Second reason for which I consider that these questions of Humanism, post-humanism, transhumanism are not relevant, are not philosophical questions. I would say that what is called human today, Hopi formerly and in a part of North America, this begins three million years ago and it is called exosomatic evolution by Alfred Lotka in this paper that was published in 1945. Now, we are living a new era in what I call the process of exosomatization. And it's an era of exosomatization that uh, is called also the Anthropocene era. And not only the Anthropocene era, but the last stage of this Anthropocene era that we call today transhumanist stage. If we want to really understand what is at stake here, we must go back to the definition of the the succession of exosomatic eras from the beginning of uh, human, of hominization of what is called human. The period beginning three million years ago is the first one and it finishes with the Upper Paleolithic period. The Upper Paleolithic period begins uh, here in uh, the Chauvet cave. I say that it was uh, discovered uh, 30 years ago 
it is considered to be 35,000 years old. But now I had a friend of mine from Australia told me that they discovered a new cave that is 70,000 years ago old. Well, uh, the process of exosomatization here uh, is the beginning of what I call hypomnesic exosomatization. That is a possibility to exteriorize and, and keep and uh, record in a technical mean that is here, pa painting, uh, a memory of, for example, the imagination of um, prehistorian people. Now, this period finishes with Neolithic. And Neolithic uh, will lead to the period of Greek empires. And from Greek empires, we'll move to Politeia. Here is the bulletarian of Milet, where was Thales at the beginning of the pre Socratic age. After this, we have many transformations. The most important of it is Renaissance and the beginning of navigation uh, with um, these armada. For example, this one is the armada of Columbus. And it is the beginning of the process of globalization. In this process, of course, I think you can't see me. Oh, qu'est-ce qui se passe? Once again, it was, okay, I'll try to share it once again. Um, it's incredible. It's really difficult. And now I cannot find my, yes, it is this one. Okay, can you see it? Yes. yes? Okay, sorry very it's very very difficult <laughs> so um after in renaissance ha happens also printing press this is the library of bologna university in the 18th century and uh, printing press has of course a determining role now the, the last stage is um, the process of industrial revolution the last stage of exosomatization with which, with industrial revolution, you will have uh, a change in all ways of life in the world. For example, Japan will be completely changed and also changed in very, very strange aesthetical inventions. For example, this one. Uh, this comes from Japan today. Well, what I try to See, to, to show, excuse me, is that the process of exosomatization opens transformations in historical eras. And today, our process of exosomatization is based on data. And, and not, it's not like these libraries, uh, because these libraries are printing press result. But here it is a kind of writing too, but it is an electronic writing. And it leads now towards through a kind of re that is called neurotechnologies. And um, I consider that we are now uh, entering a new age of exosomatization where the real question for me is not, uh, is it still human or not? If I told you, for example, um, that um, the Zinjantropus are uh, the first human who was one meter, 20 centimeters uh, tall, and uh, the weight was 30 kilos, and the, the, the face was completely different compare with our faces. Nevertheless, it is considered by anthropology to be the beginning of humankind. And I consider it, the question is not humankind. It's a question is technology. The question is exosomatization. So um, today, the real question uh, provoked by this new stage of exosomatization is what I call total proletarianization. The question is, today, 
such a stage of exosomatization opens two possibilities. The current possibility, the current reality, the current, current situation is a process of proletarianization of, for example, doctors or biologists today. They don't agree at all about what is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. They don't agree because they lost a, a large part of their knowledge and uh, the process of disruption of life on Earth produced new kind of um, epidemic production of virus, of, 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 um, of yes, a virus. And uh, the, 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 the sciences today are proletarianized by using data, by using all those technologies in a very bad way. And I will try now to show you why they are bad. If we want to understand these questions, we must follow what is said here by Ludwig van Bertalanffy. It is in his general system theory. He says that um, uh, mechanized uh, open systems become closed systems. And these closed systems become self-destructive. This is also what is said here by John Pulse, who is a mathematician from the University of Virginia, who showed that, for example, Facebook and the social networks are destroying the sociality of, of, of these networks and are destroying them um, themselves because they are destroying their business. So um, if we want to understand this question better, we must go, for example, through Roger Bartra, who published this book where he talks about what he calls an exocerebrum. He showed that it is not in the brain that is the real question. It is in between the brains, and in between the brains, you have technical uh, dimensions cre creating networks and links in between brains. What I call my, myself, not only brains, but noetic brains. Unlike other organs, the noetic brain is enhanced through internal processes of disorganization that is also what I call defunctionalization and reorganization or refunctionalization that occur in accordance with external organs that are what I call exosomatic organs. And this is also the word used by Alfred Lotka. This is what is claimed by Marian Wolf, the, the American neurologist who published Proust and the Squid. I recommend you to read this book where she shows that what is called what is what she called the reading brain, our brain, who who are capable to read, is transformed by learning, reading, and writing. These these organizations and reorganizations produced by education correspond to what Sigmund Freud described as defunctionalizations and refunctionalizations of the sensory motor system. And we now know that these transformations are based on what Stanislas Dehaene in France has described as what he described uh, as what he called neuronal recycling. What is really new about this organological transformation? that we are now living, that is the endosomatization of the exosomatic, the internalization of the externalized processes, like for example here in this brain, which consists in this addition of units, that is processes conceived and fabricated exosomatically, but endosomatically implanted, just as are those processes added to the heart or to the ears, for example, here, lies, this lies in the fact that it is now artificial memory produced in 
produced in an industrial and standardized way uh, that are being introduced into the organ of psychical memory that is the brain. Hence, is heralded the arrival and realization of the neuro industry, some of whose issues were anticipated in the 2004 film, Final Cut, that you maybe saw, as Patricia Pistols has shown in her analysis of the film. She published that in a book dedicated to cinema and brain. The new industry opens up the more general question of managing exosomatization according to the selection criteria of the market, where exosomatization is, in general, what characterizes the technical form of life that appears with and as hominization. So what is called transhumanism is the attempt to legitimate such a selection subordinated to the criteria of the market. It is an operation of marketing, strategic marketing at the global level. This necessarily and exclusively computational criteriology, however, the criteriology of the market, is absolutely illegitimate for reasons that are not ethical, but systemic. It leads inevitably to an increase of entropy. Entropy as irreversible dissipation of energy is the law of the universe that Clausius exposed in 1865. Now life is that which defer entropy, as it was showed by Erwin Schrödinger, Schrödinger in 1944 in this book. In other words, a critic of the transhumanist project as subordinating exosomatic becoming to market criteria and as radicalizing what we are now calling the disruption must start from an analysis. Um, it's incredible. C'est incroyable. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let's continue to share the screen. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, is it a good one? I cannot. Mm, now I cannot find it. Can you see it? Okay. Yes. yes. But myself, I don't see. I don't see my my. Oh, it's really difficult today. We we can Sorry. see the desktop. We can see the desktop, but we cannot see the images. Oh yes, it's it's the same for me. I don't understand why. So I will relaunch. Yes, okay. You see it now? Uh, no. No? You don't see it? I still have the des desktop. Yeah. A problem with the desktop. Uh, it's incredible. Je ne comprends pas. Je ne comprends pas. Yes, maybe you now it's coming. Yes, but myself, I don't see it. That's really difficult. I will share again. Um, no. Can you see the screen now? Yes. 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 Now we yeah. Can see. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I I can't understand what happens. It's really strange. So I was talking about uh, Schrödinger, and I was saying that 
a critic of the transhumanist project as subordinating exosomatic becoming to, to market criteria and as radicalizing what we are now calling the disruption must start from an analysis of the process of exosomatization such as that undertaken by Nicolas Georgescu Reagan in his book from the point of view of what, of what he calls bioeconomics. I recommend to read this book, that is very important for me. And um, Georgescu Reagan shows that bioeconomics, oh, c'est pas vrai. Putain. It's really very, very difficult. Is it possible to continue like this, do you think? <laughs> I'm not sure because it's really... Well, if you prefer, hmm. maybe you can send us the presentation by mail and we can open it from our computer and we can talk about it. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, can you see the screen now? No. For the moment. No? Okay, I will try to share it once again. And now? Yes, it's coming. Yes? Yes, it's coming. Okay, yeah. so let's try once again. Um, George S. Corrigan shows that bioeconomics must take into account the exosomatic situation of the human as it produces an increasing of both entropic and negantropic potentials of life. No serious reflection on all the stakes of transhumanism. Oh, c'est pas possible. C'est pas possible. Um, maybe I will stop to share the the, the, the images, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. Because and and I will continue only with uh, with the cell phone, and I will I will quit Zoom on my laptop because this is what is producing yes. uh, the the disconnection, okay? Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that no serious reflection on all the stakes of transhumanism of which cerebral rearrangement is obviously one highly specific and exemplary aspect. And on the pharmacology that all this constitutes, it is a pharmacology because, because exosomatic organs are both entropic and negantropic. No serious reflection on these stakes can be conducted without investigating organogenesis which characterizes the, the history of life in general, but which later, with the appearance of the technical form of life, that is of what Aristotle called the noetic soul, becomes above all exosomatic and not, some, not endosomatic. What is described, for example, by um, Schrödinger is the endosomatic becoming that is producing a deferral of entropy, that is what he calls negantropy. Now, what is opened by um, Lotka with exosomatic evolution is different. It opens the question of reason because as it was showed by Alfred Whitehead, reason is a process, is a function for producing bifurcations in the, in the becoming of existence because of the entropic and negantropic um, possibilities of the exosomatic organs. In Aristotle, noetic soul is a soul that is capable to think. Thinking is in Greek noesis. The exosomatic soul is noetic because it has always to decide how to play and use the exosomatic organs it produces and they are always pharmacological in the sense where Socrates defines the pharmacon. A pharmacon is a technique, an artifact, an artificial organ as it is always both a remedy and a poison, 
that is a negantropic organ and an entropic organ. The exosomatic soul raises the question of the organological and pharmacological condition of noises and of the form of life to which it corresponds, but also of the function of noises in life and faced with the disruptive transformations currently underway, the question of the future of noises itself. And for that, we should reread Whitehead, but also Georges Canguilhem. Noises is a specific case of the negantropic process that is life in general, and is so in that in, it constitutes its, excuse me, it constitutes in its inseparable relation to exosomatization what I call a negantropology. So for me, the question is not transhumanism or posthumanism. It is negantropology. Negantropology being constantly confronting the ambiguous character of exosomatic artificial organs, the latter being as pharmaca organs that make equally possible both the production of new negantropic, but I write here negantropic with an A and H, negantropic forms and a massive increase in the rate of entropy that is also entropy with the A and H. For example, when the IPCC talks about what they call anthropogenic forcings, they designate what is called in geography anthropization with the A and H, and such an anthropization is an increasing of entropy. At the moment, it is the second alternative that predominates specifically in terms of the threat to biodiversity. But where today another issue looms equally large, in particular with respect to neural technology, but also more generally data economy, that is a question of the threat to no diversity. That is the destruction of uh, Thinking, if it is true that thinking is negantropological, that is no diverse, diverse and not uh, only universal. It is firstly by asking how negantropology has unfolded since the beginning of exosomatization, about how it has been able to struggle against the anthropology in the sense of Levi Strauss when anthropology is written by Levi-Strauss with an E and no H. Uh, he says, human is a producer of entropy, first of all, and we should better call anthropology, anthropology. It is the last part, the last chapter of uh, Christotropic. I don't remember the title in English, maybe Sad Tropics. It is by... Um, studying such an anthropology and by inquiring about its stages, it is by asking how all this has either allowed or prevented the negantropological production that is inscription within the entropic becoming of the cosmos of bifurcations constituting the opening of negantropological future, that is what I call the Negantropocene, I published in America, it's not translated in, in French, uh, a book entitled The Negantropocene. It's only through these ways that we can rationally and reasonably investigate the issues, politics and economics of data economy and the future of such a data economy that is neuro industry. The question of neuro industrial reason is also and firstly that of the justice of cerebral becoming and in cerebral becoming. Justice being never a question of human rights in the degraded sense in which this phrase has been cooked in the 20th century, but the stakes and the challenge 
of the coherence of reason. This coherence of reason, in addition, conditions economic rationality. And therefore, the reason of the new critic of political economy required by the highly entropic state installed by what is called the Anthropocene era as a process of generalized proletarianization, which has led to the entropic explosion that now threatens biodiversity in general, including the human species, but therefore also threatens no all diversity as the condition of noises that is itself the condition of all negantropological bifurcations in the sense of Whitehead. From other perspectives linked to the process of full and generalized automatization that I describe in La Société Automatique, I've tried to show why and how we must now enter into an economy that systematically and systemically values negantropy, which constitutes the perspective of what the negantropocene, wherein the future lies in deprioritization, of what I call the negantropocene, wherein the future lies in the deprioritization as that which is made possible by what I call a contributory economy. Everybody now talks about the post-COVID age, but I claim that such a post-COVID age should be uh, the age of struggling against entropy through a new organization of economy. I will stop here. It's finished. I'm sorry for all these very difficult <laughs> connections, and I hope it was not too difficult for you to to follow this uh, lecture.